everybody. Uh, thanks very much for coming. My name is Aditya, and I'm the uh, co-president of MIT HSC. We're uh, the MIT group responsible for uh, for hosting Swamiji today. So here at MIT, you know, we have a, a good tradition of uh, science and engineering and very very practical uh, mindsets. But oftentimes, we uh, as students and as uh, people in the community uh, find ourselves grappling with the same questions that uh, that many people uh, find themselves worrying about. You know. Uh, how can I find happiness? Uh, what is my relationship with God? What is my relationship with myself? How can I balance my duties uh, as a, a person of the world, my, my duties in the physical realm as a scientist or as an engineer with my responsibilities in the spiritual realm? And I think that today we're very lucky and we're very blessed to have with us Swami Mukundananda Ji, who has, uh, who has the background and the uh, the great spiritual presence necessary to, to help us answer these questions. I think um, a little bit about Swamiji's background. He uh, actually has a, a B.Tech degree from the prestigious uh, Indian Institute of Technology at Delhi and uh, also an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. So he's no, uh, no stranger to the same, uh, same material, physical uh, lives and realities we all find ourselves pursuing. But in addition to that, he has... Uh, managed to pursue and, and transcend beyond that into a spiritual path. And he's made achievements in, in each sphere which are just so momentous. And we're so glad that he's here today to, uh, to help us synthesize these two realms just as he had and hopefully enlighten us just a little bit. So um, Swamiji <coughs> entered the, uh, the spiritual realm under guidance from his Guruji, uh, Jagat Guru Sri Kripalaji Maharaj, uh, affectionately called Maharajji, and has... Uh, also been the chief founder of a, uh, a unified holistic branch of yoga, uh, JK Yoga, Jagat Guru Kripalaji Yoga. And uh, hopefully that the practice of that and the philosophies of it will help us all synthesize these physical and spiritual halves of ourselves into a, a unified whole. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Swamiji and uh, his, his discourse. I hope we all find it, uh, I know we'll all find it very, very fascinating and enlightening. Thanks very much, Swamiji. It is indeed a pleasure to have this opportunity to communicate with all of you and share some interesting ideas. MIT is revered worldwide as one of the highest temples of technological education and research. When this program was getting decided, I was asked for some possible topics and I made a list of topics. And the one chosen by the Hindu Students Council was the one we see behind technology for inner engineering. What is this inner engineering technology what is its relevance to people like you who are so competent in your technological fields? And how can we utilize this other kind of technology to experience fulfillment, happiness and satisfaction in our lives? and raise our lives to sublime heights. This is what we will be discussing today. The world around us is the phenomenal world, the physical world of matter, space, forces and energy. And the technology that you all study and acquire relates to this phenomenal world. However, the Vedas inform us that there is another world where your technology does not reach. And this world is relevant to all of us. This is the world of within you the world of your own mind. You may say, Swamiji, is there a world inside me? 
I never knew it or thought about it. There is. It's a very huge world. You experience it in your dreams. At night, when you sleep, when the intellect rests, that is the time when you start dreaming. When the mind also rests, you fall into deep sleep. There are no dreams. But in that dream state, you are seeing, talking, hearing, touching, walking. How are you doing all this? Your five working senses and five knowledge senses are on the bed under the comforter. Your eyes are closed. With which eyes are you seeing in that dream? You are experiencing the world within you. In that world, it's possible sometimes you go all the way from here to India, to Hong Kong, to the moon, you start flying like a bird. There's a huge deep world within us. This world is created by ourselves. The external world is created by whatever you believe, the Big Bang or the Creator, whatever. But this external world is one. If this is a microphone, it's a microphone for all of us. However, the internal world varies for all of us. One technologist has come out with a new discovery. He is exceedingly pleased with his technology. His colleague feels envious. This fellow, he's gone ahead. I wish I had been smart enough to get this idea. The same technology is giving happiness to one and misery to the other. So the technology relates to the external world, it's a reality, it's one. And the internal sentiments of happiness and misery that each person developed was their own internal world which is different for all. So in our internal world reside our sentiments, attachments, love, hate, envy, tension, anxiety, values, emotions. This internal world is very important for all of us. Because if you think about it, the technology that you learn at the MIT will help you harness the forces of external nature, will help you utilize these things for the comforts of your body. However, the experience of fulfillment, happiness and satisfaction is not dependent upon the external objects but the state of your own mind. John Milton, the Western philosopher, had said, the mind is a place of its own and in itself can make heaven out of hell and hell out of heaven. The mind is so powerful that sitting in heaven it can make you experience hell. Sitting in hell, it can make you experience heaven. So technology will make the objects of happiness available to you. But the experience of happiness will come from the mind. Apart from that, when you go into the real world, and start utilizing this technology, you will realize, as those who have practical experience realize, that your ability to utilize this technology is directly related to the state of your mind. 
That is why very often my class fellows who passed out of the engineering college 29 years ago in the management college 27 years ago, it's interesting to see that the person who was at the bottom of the class is at the top in the corporate world. His knowledge of technology was less than his class fellows, but somehow his ability to control, inspire and focus the internal world was so much that he achieved greater success than them. So in the MIT, I was just informed, I had a wonderful tour of the campus and thanks to Aditya and Pooja for that very lovely tour and they informed me about the slogan at the MIT which is mens et manus is that right which means mind and hands well that's exactly what I wish to say you are cultivating the mind through this knowledge but you also need to learn how to manage that mind. There, this technology does not help. That is why Albert Einstein in the last century said, science has succeeded in denaturing the plutonium atom. But it cannot denature the evil in man's heart. Science does not reach there. From the Vedic perspective, there has never been any conflict between the external science and the world within. They say, Dve Vidye Veditavye Parachaiva Paracha Tatra Para Rigvedo Yajurveda Samaved Atharvangiras Itihas Purana Shiksha Kalpo Vyakaranam Niruktam Chando Jyotishamiti. They say, There are two kinds of technologies. One technology related to the phenomenal world outside. And one technology related to your own internal world. Both these are essential parts of the human experience. There is no need to deny or contradict them. And they also say that if somebody neglects the inner technology that person will attain darkness. However, if the spiritual technologist neglects the external technology, he will attain a greater darkness. So you need to utilize both these, synthesize these, to reach that final goal. So this spiritual technology, just as the material technology has by and large been the monopoly of the Western world. Since the days of the Greek civilization, the Western world has focused on the external world, understanding it and developing technologies to harness it. The Eastern Hemisphere has inclined towards the inner technology. And there have been one after the other innumerable great such sages, spiritual technologists, who made this the focus of their study, experiment and practice. And they came out with such tremendous realizations that are very powerful tools for all of us for achieving that fulfillment, satisfaction and happiness that we all seek, but we cannot get merely 
through physical sciences. So what is that inner technology? That is what we would like to understand. This inner world has got various segments. To keep the discussion simple, there is the mind and there is the intellect. By the mind, I do not mean the brain. The brain is the hardware. However, the mind is something subtle. Science is probing in to understand the distinction between the brain and the mind. The picture yet is not very clear. These spiritual scientists, the inner technologists tell us that the mind is a subtle machine inside us that is constantly generating thoughts, creating desires. And the intellect is the faculty of discrimination that's fitted into the system. So the intellect makes decisions and the mind creates desires. In this system, the intellect has the ability to control the mind. Although it does not seem so, you often feel that my mind is not under control. You do tend to feel this because you wish to focus it somewhere and the mind is running elsewhere. However, that is not so. All of us have this ability that if our intellect could firmly decide, the mind would immediately come under focus. Like for example, Do people like working in their office? Very rarely. Most people do it because they have to. That is why Friday evening is one of the best times of the week. There's a feeling of euphoria and liberation. Ah, weekend is coming. And Monday morning is a time for depression. I asked somebody in America on Monday morning, how are you? He said, what, how are you, Swamiji? Today is Monday morning. In other words, people do not like to work. And yet, everybody sits there in their office and applies themselves to their work for the duration of the working hours from 8 to 5 or whatever it is. How did that mind come under control? Because the intellect decided this is necessary. If I do not do it, I will lose my job. And in these days of recession, there are not many alternative jobs in the market. So if you want to feed yourself and the family, you better do this. When the intellect decided the absolute necessity of it, the mind came under focus. You are doing this throughout the day. Your mind says, at 8 o'clock in the night, I would like to see that TV serial that's coming. The intellect says, tomorrow is your final exam, you better sit and study. So the intellect controls the mind and you sit and study. The fact that you have made it, the students to the MIT, is an indication of the extent to which you have exercised the power of the intellect over the mind to dedicate yourself to your studies and excel in them. 
But the fact is, every student does this. Parents come to me, Swamiji, please explain something to my child. He doesn't apply his mind to studies. He keeps playing all day long. He is your child. Why don't you explain to him? He doesn't listen to me. All right, my son. Why don't you focus on your studies? Swamiji, I don't like it. Mine doesn't remain there. That is his, the nature of his mind. And the same student, when he sits in the examination hall to answer the question paper, for three hours, he brings his mind into complete focus. He doesn't even look at the neighbors or peep out of the window. After three hours, the examiner has to pull the paper away. It's time up. Please give it. Look at the amount of concentration that the student developed. How did this happen when his mind was so unfocused? That was the power of the intellect. The discrimination of the intellect realized that these three hours are of vital importance. Now, Mr. Mind, if you fool around, it will not work. You will have to repeat the year. So when the intellect decided this is important, the mind came into focus. That kind of focus, if he had maintained throughout the year, he or she would have topped the school. But throughout the year, the intellect said, you know, studies is important, but not for me, for my parents. For me, football is more important. When the decision of the intellect was otherwise, there was no question of controlling the mind. So you see the power that the intellect holds over the mind. Now that power is not being utilized in our daily lives. To utilize that power, we need a little bit of knowledge and then implementation. So what is this knowledge? that we will be discussing further. The mind that we wish to control and direct and channelize to attain our ultimate goal, this mind keeps on creating a number of desires. Some of these desires are beneficial for us. Some of these are detrimental to us. Some of them elevate us. Some of them degrade us. We all experience there are varieties of desires that are being thrown up by the mind. And it is in our best interest to reduce the lower desires and enhance the upper desires. The Vedic scriptures, these textbooks for the inner technology, they divided these desires into three categories. In fact, the material energy, they divided it into three categories. Now, when I say material energy, they say that not only is this the material energy, the inner world is also created by the material energy. So that has three categories. The mode of goodness or sattva gun. <coughs> the mode of passion or rajogun. And the mode of ignorance or tamogun. So when the mode of ignorance dominates a person's personality, that person experiences the desire for violence, 
anger, intoxication, laziness, sleep, indolence. These are the general traits of the mode of ignorance. When the mode of passion predominates in a person's personality, it leads to intense desires for the objects of the senses, intense ambition for worldly enhancement, for prestige, for attainment of worldly objects. When the mode of goodness predominates, that leads to peace of mind, the desire to cultivate knowledge, the desire for compassion, for service. All these are symptoms of the mode of goodness. So we all have our natural disposition of our mind as it is characterized by these three modes. And we would like to eliminate the lower desires and to enhance or develop the higher desires. I mean, if you were given a choice, you would rather have a burning passion for knowledge than an incurable urge for ice creams. Because you know it would lead to the problem of obesity and then cholesterol and so many other things. So these desires get us into trouble and we wish to reduce them and there are desires we would like to befriend. Desires that elevate our life, that raise it to sublime heights. But how to do this is a constant struggle. So these inner technologists gave us a wonderful understanding of how this system works. Now I have read Western psychology, I have read all the works of Freud and Carl Jung and Adler and Mikleyland and Maslow, but I would like you all to hear the Vedic psychology. Now, how perfectly it describes the functioning of the inner system. See, these desires, they can have two ends. Either they will be fulfilled or they will be unfulfilled. If the desires get fulfilled, let's say if they get unfulfilled, what happens? It leads to anger. Let us say that the husband decided that he wants to really indulge his tongue today and have his favorite ice cream. And he went to the market, got five kgs of ice cream, placed it in the refrigerator and went out for his one hour walk by the riverside to work up an appetite so that he comes back and then he can enjoy his ice cream even further. But after one hour when he returned and opened the fridge, he found there was no ice cream. He got infuriated. He asked his wife, I had placed ice creams there, where have they gone? The wife said, my dear husband, didn't the doctor say your cholesterol is going high? I have thrown it into the garbage. What? You threw the ice cream? Now he became angry. What was the cause of this anger? The desire was created. There was an obstruction in its fulfillment that led to anger. Anger never comes by itself. Desire is the cause. One lady came to me. She said, Swamiji, everything is all right, but I have one problem. I have a lot of anger. I said, everything is all right. 
that's not possible if the mother if the child is there the mother must also be there if you experience anger that means there is this desire so if that desire is not fulfilled it leads to anger now what happens if it gets fulfilled let us say that he did find the ice cream there and he did ind indulge in it ah so nice you had five spoons are you satisfied no i want more all right some more another five enough no i want more all right you've had 25 spoons enough yeah today it's enough but after three days i want more ice creams so the vedas say the nature of this desire is such if you fulfill it it will be extinguished for some time then it will come back with redoubled intensity in other words it will lead to greed <clears throat> na jatu kamah kamah nam upabhoge na shamyati havisha krishna vartme va bhuya eva bhivardhate this is the bhagavatam stating actually the buddha also made desire the entire focus of his analysis and he explained it as the cause of misery so the bhagavatam verse that i stated it's it says that if you try and extinguish fire by pouring clarified butter on it for a moment it may get extinguished but after that it will blaze up even more such is the nature of this desire that is why the vedic literature has gone to this extent of saying that if some fortunate spiritual scientist if some fortunate soul can totally eliminate desire that person becomes like god यदा सर्वे प्रमुच्यन्ते कामा ये सर्वेश्रिता अथ मर्त्यो मृतो भवत्यत्र ब्रह्म समश्नुते ब्रह्म मीन्स गॉड यो न कामयते किञ्चित ब्रह्म भूयाय कल्पते द प्रीवियस वर्स फ्रॉम फ्रॉम द उपनिषद्स एंड दिस इज द महाभारत ब्रह्म भूयाय दैट पर्सन हु हैज गिवन अप डिजायर्स becomes like god so these desires have two consequences on fulfillment they lead to greed all right everybody is with me and unfulfillment they lead to anger if that is the case now we wish to remove certain desires and enhance other desires so we need to find out the cause for desire what is the cause of desire now everybody is getting different desires somebody while sitting in the lecture the mind goes to the pizza somebody who are sitting in the lecture goes to the football game now everybody is experiencing different desires what is the cause of these desires it's very interesting the bhagavad gita says sangat sanjayate kam it's not as you would common sensically think that intrinsic qualities of something are creating desire the cause of desire is the attachment of your mind whoever has the mind attached to whichever object or person repeatedly experiences 
the desire for that object or person. Like for example, take alcohol. It's an obnoxious thing by itself, foul smelling. But you ask the same question to an alcoholic. Says, who says it is foul smelling? The moment I go by the pub and I get a whiff of the whiskey, I start swaying from side to side. Now, because of the attachment of the mind, that alcoholic is experiencing the desire. Let me clarify through another example. There are mothers also sitting here, fathers also sitting here. You hold your child, you smell your child, you place your nose on the child's cheek and head and you feel very joyous from the child's bodily smell. Supposing I was to tell you to hold your nose on your neighbor's body for 10 minutes, could you do it? Swamiji, there is a smell. You are getting a smell from your neighbor. You don't get this obnoxious smell from the child. I should but I don't get it. I don't know why. Your mind is attached. In that attachment even a foul smell has become a wonderful aroma. One mother, <clears throat> her son got lost in the fair. She went to the police booth and said, I have lost my child. The policeman said, Mother, five lost and found children have been brought here. Take a look which of them is yours. <coughs> the mother looked. None of them is my child. The policeman said, Mother, how does your child look like? Well, he is blind in one eye and slightly paralyzed, so his face is contorted on one side and his hand also is affected by paralysis. He keeps it like this and he walks with a limp. The policeman says, how stupid mother, you saw such beautiful children. Why don't you just lift any of them, hug them and experience your motherly affection? Why are you desiring this contorted, ugly child of yours? The mother says, Mr. Policeman, you will not understand a mother's heart. I will only be able to sleep after I see that ugly, contorted child of mine. The mother doesn't want just beauty. She wants her child in which her mind has got attached. So, wherever your mind has been attached, that is the desire that you experience again and again. And when the desire is created, the two consequences, fulfillment will lead to greed, unfulfillment would lead to anger and the Bhagavad Gita goes beyond. Krodhat bhavati sammohaha sammohat smriti vibhramaha smriti bhranchat buddhinasho buddhinashat pranashyati It says from anger will come delusion. From delusion will come bewilderment of memory. And when the memory is bewildered the intellect will be ruined. And when the intellect is ruined, that person will be lost. Lost, in other words, suffer a downfall. So all this has stemmed from the attachments. Now, if that is the case, what then is the cause for attachment? I am taking the logic back step by step. And when I speak in the MIT, I am confident that the listeners, they have 
they have they will be able to follow the logic right down till the end what then is the cause of attachment everybody is attached to different things somebody is attached to corporate success to the extent they ignore family life somebody is attached to the wife or the husband corporate success is insignificant somebody is attached to games for somebody it's money 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 all day long what is the cause of attachment you see we have not thought about it because our focus has been the external world the cause of attachment really is very simple when we repeatedly contemplate that there is happiness somewhere when we repeatedly think there is happiness here there is happiness here this repeated contemplation of happiness in any object or person leads to attachment after all how did a person get attached to cigarettes if the person thinks about it when he or she went to college and experienced the new found freedom he saw my class fellow has got the cigarette dangling in his hand and he is creating these smoke rings his personality is appearing very impressive if i do the same i will also be impressive in other words he contemplated happiness in that pipe which creates smoke such a ridiculous thing but he contemplated happiness there and he tried it out but it was a terrible experience he coughed his eyes watered it was foul smelling but then he kept repeating this thought no there is happiness there my friends get it i will also get it that repeated contemplation is what created the attachment first it was one a day hiding under the staircase and the restroom from the parents and then after that two a day then three a day then it formed a link one is over he wants the other that is over he wants the next now he has got attached this was created by his own repeated contemplation somebody contemplated happiness in tea you know when i tell people that why do you take tea it's not beneficial for health the chemicals in it are not conducive for good health why do you take it they say swami ji if i don't take tea my head will feel dizzy tell me when nobody was drinking tea in this world was everybody feeling dizzy there was a time when tea was drunk only in england however when they rule the world they pass on the habit to others i hear from my parents that in india people were given tea free of charge and later on when they started getting addicted they were charged one paise then it became two paise and now people buy that little cup of tea for 5 rupees from the railway station now they have got attached so that attachment which got created was by this process of repeated thinking repeated contemplation of there being happiness somewhere so the whole chain becomes clearer if we repeatedly think there is happiness somewhere it will lead to attachment and from attachment will come desire from desire will come greed and anger 
we seem to have got almost at the end of our research. Why now? Ponder over this point. Why do we repeatedly contemplate that there is happiness anywhere? Why does this contemplation take place? That, the Vedas say, is our very nature. That is the nature of our being. We have all emanated from an ocean of bliss. That supreme divine entity, whom you call God, Lord, Allah, Bhagavan, Ram, Sham, is an infinite ocean of bliss. We have been created from that infinite ocean of bliss. Our very nature is to seek bliss. As the little part is naturally drawn to the whole. That's the law of gravitation. The apple that fell on Newton's head, it was the earth pulling its little part. So in this case, the ocean of bliss is pulling us. It's tiny fragments to itself. And we, tiny fragments, are naturally experiencing this urge for bliss. That is an irrevocable aspect of our personality. That nobody can cut. You practice spirituality for ages. You practice science and technology for ages. You go to any portion of this world. You will never be able to do away with this urge to experience bliss and happiness. So this urge for bliss is natural to us. That is why somewhere or the other, based on the environment we get, based upon our tendencies carrying over, we contemplate there is happiness here, there is happiness here. And once we have done that contemplation, the whole chain is now irrevocable. It will lead to attachment, which will lead to desire, which will lead to anger and greed. So when this urge for happiness is intrinsic to our being, how then? Do we tackle this process and utilize it for our benefit? Once we have understood the sequence, it can be put to our use. Now, without understanding the sequence, people endeavor. Give up anger. Give up anger. How do I do it? Is it some kind of a garland that I take it off and put it? I've given it up. Tell me how to give it up. You know, William James, he created a formula. He said there are two things. One is desire and one is the objects you have. If desire is a lot, the objects are less, you will be unhappy. If the objects are plenty, desire is less, you will be happy. So he said, reduce desire. Now, if I had a chance, I would ask him, that's all very well, but please tell me how to reduce desire. There was once a centipede that developed arthritis. Now imagine, a human being with arthritis, how painful it is, and a centipede with 100 legs having arthritis. So an owl was passing by. The owl looked at the centipede and said, you know, I'm feeling pity on your condition. Can I make a suggestion? The centipede said, go ahead. <clears throat> if you could become a swan, your miseries would reduce to just 2% of the present. The centipede said, that is a brilliant suggestion. 
ha i never thought of it till today so mr owl can you tell me how can i become a swan the owl said i don't know i only make policy decisions <laughs> so similarly it's all very well to say give up anger and give up desire how do you do it now one spiritual technologist who's the most prolific writer in the vedic tradition the great sage ved vyas he has put this whole technique of inner transformation into one verse in in the shrimad bhagavatam he says vishayan dhyaya taschittam vishayeshu vishajjate mam anusmara taschittam mayeva pravilyate he says it is so simple you repeatedly thought there is happiness in these objects of the senses in worldly things you developed attachment for them now you repeatedly think there is happiness in the place where you wish to channelize your desire ved vyas of course is referring to god himself he says repeatedly contemplate there is happiness in god and when you do that again and again it will lead to attachment in god just like it led to attachment in these mundane things and when you develop attachment for god it will lead to desire for god or if you have developed attachment for knowledge you have your intellect has repeatedly contemplated that knowledge is the highest thing service to society is the highest thing and you contemplated over this sufficiently you convinced your intellect about this that will lead to attachment in these sublime things and that attachment will lead to these higher desires and those higher desires will not downgrade you they will uplift you so to desire is not wrong to desire the right thing is the secret these great sages whom world over they are respected as great prophets great sages and saints what was common to all of them an intense desire for the sublime for the supreme for divine love for divine knowledge for detachment from mundane things they had this desire that the faculty of desire was millions of times greater developed than an us but they had channelized it in the right manner so in this technological system you decide focus analyze what is it that you cherish in life that you wish to become that you hold in high esteem in your intellectual value system and then contemplate sufficiently over it that contemplation will result naturally in everything else when you develop the intense desire स यत कामो भवति तत् क्रतुर भवति यत् क्रतुर भवति तत् कर्म कुरुते यत् कर्म कुरुते तदपि निष्पद्यते द वेदास गिव दिस फार्मूला फॉर मोटिवेशन दे से व्हेन यू हैव एन इंटेंस डिजायर यू विल मेक अ डिटरमिनेड रिजॉल्व व्हेन यू हैव अ डिटरमिनेड रिजॉल्व यू विल पुट इन इंटेंस एफर्ट and when you put in intense effort that is how you will become now the problem is without understanding the system we allowed our intellect to wander away 
we allowed our intellect to do its work in an unguided manner and if we can understand this we can guide the intellect and through the intellect guide the mind so finally i would like to present this model that is given in the kathopanishad आत्मागम रथिन विद्धि शरीर रथमेवथु बुद्धि तो सारथि विद्धि मन प्रग्रहवान्नर इंद्रिया हयान्याहुर्षयांस्तु गोचरा आत्मेन्द्रिय मनोयुक्त भोक्ते त्याहुर्मनीषिण कठोपनिषद इज स्टेटिंग दैट देर इज अ चैरियट इट्स रेफरिंग टू योर बॉडी एज द चैरियट this chariot has got horses five horses there are reins in the mouth of the horses from the mouths the reins are in the hands of the charioteer the driver standing there and there is a passenger sitting behind now ideally the passenger should instruct the charioteer come on this is my desired destination and the whole contraption will go in the desired direction but here what is happening is that the passenger has gone to sleep so these horses have taken over the horses say we wish to go there we wish to go there they tug at the reins and the charioteer for lack of guidance just directs the chariot in the direction where the horses tug now the chariot is the body <coughs> the five horses are the five senses within us the reins from the mouths of these horses this is the mind that has the ability to control these horses the senses the reins are in the hands of the intellect the charioteer and the passenger seated behind is the seat of consciousness the soul itself that is energizing the whole system because of which there is life you know albert giorgi a uh, nobel prize winner he said in my search for life i ended up with electrons and protons somewhere down the line consciousness slipped out of my hands in my old age i am tracing my steps backward what is the basis of consciousness all the scientific community is puzzled by this riddle is consciousness created merely from combinations of electrons and protons and neutrons it doesn't seem a sufficient answer so the vedas are saying there is the source of consciousness which is the soul the real you seated inside that is energizing this whole system when that leaves the system is insentient when it is present there is sentience everywhere you prick a thorn into the finger oh what happened it's paining there is life there is sentience similarly the mind intellect have all been energized by the presence of that seat of consciousness the soul now the problem is the soul is sleeping if you can use that soul power if you can wake up to your inner potentialities and first of all bring this intellect under control through sublime knowledge through elevated through divine truths illumine this intellect and then utilize that illumined intellect guide the intellect don't let the intellect roam without guidance and then use that intellect 
to control the mind as we had discussed by repeatedly contemplating the place for happiness which you cherish and then utilize the mind to rein in the five horses the senses in this manner the vedas say use this machinery that has been granted to you to cross over this vast material ocean and reach your final goal final destination which is god which is the supreme lord himself thank you all so much so i have a couple of questions so one question is um so i understand everything you said why do you think we come from uh god into this world i mean what's the purpose there must be a purpose otherwise it all seems quite pointless that's one question um because if the point is you come from there and then you like travel travel and you go back and the way to be happy is to get back so why did you leave to begin with um and the second point is i think uh quite a large number of people maybe at MIT in particular they have quite a very developed intellect in a particular area let's say you know math or physics or biology whatever they're working on and the intellect is very developed and controlled in that area but that uh frequently does not correspond to the intellect also being developed in other areas which uh on a human level might be even more important So how does that happen and that leads to the kind of um a small follow up question of is there such a thing as a mission or a path or when a person is um born and they feel in themselves that this is what I should do and what's the view what's the point of it all that's a question that is you know all pervading everybody asks that 15 days ago I was in Stanford speaking on science and spirituality the same very question was almost the first to come up it's natural when you see all this maze around you wonder why are you here well a very beautiful story that i heard of which kind of appeals to me to answer this question there was a billionaire this billionaire had a 15 year old son one day the father was out of the office and the son was scavenging the office when he came across a newspaper which was 15 year old edition and there was an article there billionaire adopts orphan child that boy was shocked does this refer to me there's my father's name and the age date matches when his father returned he asked him father is this article correct the father said yes it is he was downfallen the son said father i am not your child no my son i adopted you why did you do that so the father said son i am a billionaire i have got everything that money can buy but i did not have anyone to share this with i have adopted you so that i may be able to give you everything that i have so similarly our source that supreme lord like i said is an ocean of infinite bliss he is perfect and complete in himself however out of his creativity he creates his tiny little parts so that he can share with us everything he has his divine knowledge his divine bliss his divine love however he is he wants us to work our way towards that creation and the vedic perspective is not of one lifetime it says it's a journey that's did not begin upon birth it's continuing from lifetimes you are slowly over multiple lifetimes 
attaining that perfection. And if at present the experience of misery is greater than that of bliss, you may feel discouraged and say, oh, it's so useless. But if you could know the whole design and what you would get at the end of it, you'd say, oh, so wonderful, so amazing. One day I will have that infinite love, bliss of God. So I see you wear this garb, um, the saffron garb. What is the purpose of this and why is this specific color? This is a very well-known color among other Swamis also. Um, I happen to know what it is, but I just wanted to know why you choose this specific color also. What I have described to you here is really pure knowledge. Principles that are non-sectarian and non-culture specific. However, this knowledge has come out from that Vedic culture. So, my spirituality has been nourished from that Vedic culture. So, there are certain things that are cultural. So, the culture and the tradition from which I come, this dress has a significance. Just like a policeman is a policeman even without that dress. However, in the discharge of his duty, that attire has an importance. It facilitates his duty. So similarly in the Vedic tradition and also in the Buddhist tradition, these are the robes of a monk, of a sannyasi, of a renunciant. So they indicate that somebody has dedicated himself or herself totally to the cultivation of of this spiritual knowledge and the attainment of that spiritual goal. Swamiji, this external world, world is perfectly synchronized. Everybody sees the same thing, but uh, they perceive separately. So one, one get happiness, whereas other get misery. So the same thing happens with our inner world, whether, whether it is synchronized. What I said was that the external world is really one. It's a reality. So there is, it's not that it's different for everybody. The internal world is different for everybody. Because the internal world has not been created by the creator. We have created it ourselves. By our mind and intellect. By our contemplations over endless lifetimes. So, the perception of happiness and distress is not coming from the external world per se. It is being filtered by our internal world. So, that is why, again the Vedas say, if some fortunate soul could purify that internal world in the way they recommend and make it divine, how would they perceive this external world? they would perceive it as the form of God. The perfected soul would see this whole world as the form of God. Siya Ram Maya Sab Jag Jani Kara Pranam Jori Jug Pani Anuman states that I see the Supreme Lord seated in everybody. Hence, I fold my hands and offer my Namaskar to everyone. Okay, so just coming back to your question, you said that in the MIT people have developed their intellects in certain directions. So that is why uh, at the beginning of this discourse, I emphasized that you need to understand the importance of this to your life. You see, it is lack of this spiritual knowledge that created a lopsidedness. And very often people have not been exposed to this knowledge. So that creates this lopsidedness. When it comes to education, education is considered as only education related to the phenomenal world. But there is another aspect that is so important that we are neglecting. 
when I speak to managers, now they all realize, I bring it to their awareness that you realize that your ability to function as a manager doesn't just depend upon your manager knowledge, but on the extent to which you can manage your own mind. Even psychology has got the term emotional intelligence. So while doing your MBA, was it not relevant to understand how to manage the mind? That aspect has been neglected. We keep on developing material education, we ignore this. So we have got engineer making education. We have got doctor making education. Finally, money making education. Out of it all you get money. But we don't have human making education. And that is so important. So it's a question of understanding its importance. And then if we give it a priority in our lives, we will spend time on it. And when we spend time on it, the brilliant people of MIT, it will not take them long to grasp this and then utilize it for achieving fulfillment in their lives. Swamiji, I perfectly understand about the inner engineering you talked about, but I think the whole materialistic world, there are a lot of successful people and if everybody wants to go to inner engineering, uh, how this world will function because you definitely need you know, the technology people to have innovation or is it a myth for this uh, external world? Like perfect example is Steve Jobs, you know, he was in the best country, but he died of cancer. Uh, maybe he might have chose another path and he would have been more happy. So I just want to see, understand the cycle comparison between the inner engineering versus external engineering. Can a person be happy and successful with the external world attachment or is it a myth? The outer engineering is not bad. It's not an evil at all. After all, if you are hearing me easily today, it's through this technology, the microphone, right? Now, this technology in itself is neither good nor bad. The way you utilize it is what makes all the difference. Is a knife good or is a knife bad? In the hands of a dacoit, it's an instrument of murder. In the hands of a surgeon, it's an instrument of saving lives. So the knife in itself is neither good nor bad. How we use it makes the difference. Now, uh, the outer technology is perfect, it's fine, but it doesn't have any values. It doesn't say this is good and that is bad. Technology, science doesn't have values. It doesn't present us with an ethical and moral system to decide what is its proper utilization. So many years ago, the president of America, Eisenhower, had come to India. Now, when somebody comes to India, you know, they, they traditionally respected as the land of spirituality. So in his lecture in Delhi, he said, God has given us nuclear power. We pray to God that he gives us the good intellect, that we utilize it properly. Now, where will this good intellect come from? That is where you need this inner technology. You need the spiritual science. So this conception that there is a conflict between the outer technology and the inner technology is not really correct. They can both be augmented. And that is the same thing holds for the world cultures. You have the Western culture, which is materialistically advanced and the Eastern culture which is spiritually advanced. They are both having their good points. If they could be combined, you could take the best of both, you would have a perfect situation. So I am not in any 
stage as suggesting that this is wrong. I am saying it needs to be augmented.